Good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us. This is the Greater Santa Fe Fireshed uh, presentation on the ecological role of fire in the Santa Fe Mountains interactive webinar. I'm your host and chair of the Greater of the and chair of the Greater Santa Fe Fireshed yeah, Coalition for Fidio Chavaria. Remind participants, uh, you know, that these landscapes that we are talking about in the Greater Santa Fe Fireshed are the ancestral lands of the Pueblo people and all the Native Americans that were here, you know, in time between time immemorial. And I want to thank you all for joining us. Tonight's webinar is to learn about fire ecology across this landscape from the scientists who have been studying this area for, for the past few decades. A few housekeeping uh, items. Uh, the format is we'll have presentations by three leading scientists, and then we'll have a facilitated question and answer period. The Greater Santa Fe Fireshed Coalition was formed in December of 2015 when the City of Santa Fe Fire Chief Eric Litzenberg and State Forestry Tony Delphine convened a meeting to ask if there was a willingness to work together to prevent a devastating wildfire that would affect Santa Fe. At the time, the city was working on a, a CFRP project uh, to bolster the Wildland Urban Interface Program in Education and Outreach. The Forest Stewards Guild had proposed a fire shed and um, map and project area, which became the now fire shed boundary. The, and uh, let me show you that really quickly here. So this is the fire shed boundary. And soon after that, the city and the county both passed complementary resolutions in 2016, designating this area as the fire shed. The fire shed's vision for this, the coalition's vision, is a landscape with healthy forests and secure water sources, communities in and near forested landscapes around uh, that are fire adapted with residents who take responsibility to reduce risks before wildfire occurs, prepared communities feel secure and understand the role of fire in the landscape, residents support treatments including prescribed burns and manage fires, and accept smoke associated with fire management. Fire using agencies provide well coordinated safe and effective response to wildfires, strive to mitigate smoke impacts to communities, uh, and resilient forests and thriving communities provide economic, recreational, and spiritual benefits for residents and visitors to enjoy. Now I'd like to introduce you to our, our speakers tonight. We have uh, Craig Allen, Tom Swetnam, and Ellis Margolis, and I will go ahead and kick it off to them to begin their presentations. All right, how's that looking? They're looking good there, Ellis. Great. All right, thank you. Um, thanks uh, for your time, everyone. And uh, I'm excited to talk to talk about a place that uh, I've uh, been working in for, for many years. But first, I'm going to introduce myself, uh, Ellis Margolis. I live in Santa Fe, and I work for the US Geological Survey as an ecologist. I've been working in uh, these mountains for uh, since 1999, studying fire and forests. Um, I'm probably one of the few people who have uh, legally uh, camped and or backpacked in the Santa Fe watershed, uh, studying fires and forests. And uh, it's been a great opportunity to get to know those mountains. And when I'm not working in the forest, I'm playing in the forest and out uh, with my family doing various things. Uh, or the rivers that come out of the forested mountains as well. And the last thing I'll say is uh, I love tree rings. And hopefully by the end of this, I'll convince you that uh, tree rings are pretty cool. Uh, with that, I'll share a, a photo here, which is uh, unfortunately way too common. Uh, this is the in Medio fire of 2020. And uh, again, just highlighting what we all have uh, known and observed recently is that fires are increasing across northern New Mexico, um, across the southwest, across the western U.S., and uh, even western North America. So as, uh, you know, a, a common song uh, may ask, well, how did we get here? And so I'm going to talk a little bit about what we know uh, about that. So there is a long history of fire in northern New Mexico, and uh, one of the ways we can understand that history is uh, through tree rings, and particularly tree ring fire scars. So a fire scar is when a uh, forms when a tree is burned by a fire but not killed, 
and is wounded, just like we have a wound. Uh, these trees will actually record those wounds as fire scars and can take a sample uh, mostly from dead and down wood and we can prepare this sample, uh, sand it up, and then uh, date the rings. And based on the pattern of the rings, we can usually date the rings uh, to the year they formed and then the fire scars uh, often to the year they formed and very, uh, very often even to the season they formed based on when we know trees start and stop growing. Here is an example from the Santa Fe watershed and the years marked are years when this ponderosa pine was burned uh, but not killed and uh, recorded a fire scar here in 1664, the year 1685 and 1700. And so uh, we're lucky enough uh, in Northern New Mexico to have uh, some of the uh, densest networks of tree ring fire scars uh, actually in North America. And uh, here you're looking at uh, the Jemez Mountains to the left is the, the really big blob there. And uh, if you can see my cursor and then to the right, uh, the, the bottom right uh, is the Santa Fe fire shed area. And we'll zoom in to the Santa Fe fire shed. Here we're looking at the fire shed, the same map uh, Porfirio showed with the outline of the fire shed and all the individual dots are trees that we've collected over the past few decades to uh, understand tree ring fire history. We will zoom in to one of these clusters, uh, the most recent, uh, one of the most recent collections that basically follows uh, the ski hill road, if you will, from the Tasuke drainage all the way north to in, in Medio drainage. And when you look at uh, these records, uh, from these ponderosa pine and mixed conifer forests, uh, you see evidence of a lot of fires. So I'll walk you through this figure on the bottom is a timeline and uh, from the year uh, 1300 at the bottom left to the uh, bottom right is out to the present. And each horizontal line is the tree ring record of a fire scarred tree that we were able to date. And uh, the vertical tick marks are the fire scars. And so you can see uh, fire scars across the record uh, all the way back uh, into the 1300s and then coming out into the late 1800s. And when we have these records dated to the year, we can uh, calculate things by how often fires occurred. And uh, on average in this landscape that was sampled, uh, every six years there was a fire somewhere. And if you look at uh, proportions, large proportions of trees scarred by a single fire, there were large fires in that landscape approximately every 12 years on average. Um, but then, and, and these fires uh, very likely looked like this. This is a photo of a prescribed fire from the Santa Fe watershed. These were uh, very likely low severity fires, creeping through grass and needle litter, um, not killing the trees. Uh, fire scar is unequivocal evidence uh, of low severity fire because the tree has to survive uh, the fire to record it. And so going back to the data, you see that uh, this fire regime of frequent low severity fires stopped uh, approximately 130 years ago. The last uh, fire widespread was 1890, and then there has virtually been no fire since. Uh, the Enmedio fire that crept on the edge of the fire shed may have been one of the first uh, relatively large fires. So it's been a long time, uh, over a century uh, without fire. And with that uh, removal of that very important process, then the forests increased in density. And we know this again through tree rings. If you're looking at this photo from the Santa Fe fire shed, this was very common. Um, the orange bark trees we've learned through tree ring data are uh, trees that are usually at least 100, 120 years old. And in this uh, photograph, we know that those trees were alive uh, back when these fires were burning. And so we can think about how dense the forest might have been. And you can too, as you're walking around in the forest, and especially with ponderosa pine, because they have that orange color, indicates, well, that's what the forest used to look like back when fires are burning. So if we count the number of orange bark trees we see in this picture, I'm seeing four, and then uh, benefit of the doubt, we'll give that down log uh, a five. And so in, in that scene, uh, back when fires were burning in the late 1800s, you would have had five trees in the picture. And now uh, we can count all of these uh, blackjack ponderosa pines uh, that are younger than that, and we've dated to much younger, and they've all came in after the fires stopped, and uh, you get the point here. There are a lot of them, and uh, in, in these landscapes where we've done the work, and in other places across the West, densities of forests have increased 
five to tenfold. And so a uh, forest that used to have 100 trees per acre, uh, widely spaced ponderosa pine, now can have upwards of 1,000 trees per acre. And essentially, all of those trees that have accrued over the last uh, century are energy. And when the forests burn again, that energy is, is released. And we see these unfortunate fires uh, of today. This is a photo of uh, Crown Fire from uh, Los Conchas uh, in the Jemez Mountains. Um, uh, one effect we see from these large, severe fires um, uh, that are highly anomalous are that they're killing forests that we know uh, survive many fires for centuries, and they're killing large swaths of these forests. And uh, we have multiple studies to suggest that they're probably not going to come back, in part because uh, of regeneration limitations and lack of seed source. And a lot of these are coming back as shrub fields. If you ever uh, are in the Jemez Mountains, an example of a place that's burned and reburned, there are places that were forests for centuries that are now shrub fields, and we were working in those all summer. And they're uh, very likely not going to come back. This is a pattern that we're seeing uh, in northern New Mexico, unfortunately. Um, it's across the southwest, and it's also occurring across western North America as these fires are becoming more intense and larger than they have been in the past. Uh, bear with me here, and, and let's take a little trip over to uh, the Sierra Nevada Mountains of California. This is an example, I think, that demonstrates this, these changing fire regimes and the uh, just the uniqueness and, and, and incredible nature of, of how these fires have uh, been killing forests these days. Um, this is a giant sequoia. If you haven't been there, go see them. They're incredible trees. Uh, put it on your life list. And um, a, a sobering statistic that has come out of work at a giant sequoia from colleagues of the Park Service, that 13 to 19 percent of the large giant sequoias on planet Earth were killed by fire in the last five years last five years, right? I, I read that and, and, it, and it just kind of st st struck me to the heart. And, and uh, this summer I said, you know what, family, we're going to see these giant sequoias. So there's a photo of my kid out there. Um, it's, it's just amazing. And to me, it's indicative of, of the changing fire regimes and the severity of these recent fires. Um, you'll see from uh, this is work that uh, Tom Swetna will be speaking next. He pioneered uh, tree ring dating and giant sequoias, and they, they, many of these trees survived um, you know, upwards of 100 fires over multiple millennia, and they're dying. These same trees are dying now in modern fires. It just goes to show how, uh, how much the, the world has changed and how severe the fires are uh, in, in these places, again, from the same process, the increased density after we stopped fires. So, uh, the, the bad news doesn't end there. Unfortunately, as we, we've experienced uh, after all of these fires come the floods. And here's some photos uh, from Northern New Mexico uh, and uh, bottom one, the upper right is from the Gila uh, and, and the left is from Bandelier where um, we've had these severe fires and then the flooding and the, the photos of the circles. Uh, there are people just for scale and these tiny little creeks that normally you can jump over, um, they're, they're increasing their flows by 10 to 100 fold uh, and creating these giant log piles that look like something, you know, a, a dinosaur or beaver may have created. But uh, it just shows the power and the change of these systems uh, after, these, after these fires, uh, you end up with these horrible floods. Uh, here's a little video. Um, this was from Flagstaff, who had that, uh, you know, bad fire this summer. And then flooding thereafter just to demonstrate uh, what happens. And again, this is all too common. Just uh, you know, normal monsoon rainstorm on these uh, these denuded landscapes, and you get scenes like this. So um, these uh, remind us that uh, forests, fire, and water supplies are connected. And uh, as I'm sitting here in Santa Fe, uh, it's important to remember that uh, you know. Right now, uh, a third of the water uh, from, for Santa Fe comes from this forested watershed. This is a photo of the Santa Fe watershed. <clears throat> and so uh, with the, that in mind, uh, working with the city of Santa Fe and uh, thinking about the potential for post-fire flooding and debris flows, uh, we've just, uh, um, we're wrapping up a study looking at uh, modeling um, fire and debris flows in the Santa Fe watershed. Um, and here you're looking at three fire severity scenarios for a low, moderate, and high severity fire. And, um, and we use these to plug into debris flow models to understand the debris flow potential in the Santa Fe watershed. Um, 
The, the colors here, uh, yellow is a low severity fire. Again, this is a um, fire, um, these are fire simulations and orange is moderate severity fire and um, red is the hot fire and orange and red are those tree killing fires. So uh, one thing you can see are these yellow blocks and I've highlighted the areas that have been treated. Those are modeled to be lower severity, severity in, the, um, in the low fire uh, weather fire and even per, um, percolating all the way through to the, the high um, probability fire weather scenario on the far right there, you still see some benefit of treatments to lower fire severity. And then that translates um, to the debris flows. So uh, fire severity is strongly uh, linked to debris flow. And so here you're looking uh, at um, a three by three scenario of those fire weather scenarios uh, on, the, on the left. And so the 75th percentile is that uh, low severity fire, 90th percentile fire weather is that moderate, and then 97th is uh, the high severity fire. And then we paired that with three rain events and uh, a two-year return interval rain event. So, you know, relatively common five-year and then a very maximum rain event. And so that's the, the three by three you're looking at. And uh, one thing that we, we can see um, is that uh, from the results, if you a moderate severity fire plus a moderate rain event, you get estimates of uh, over a thousand acre feet of debris. That's approximately 30% of the capacity of the reservoirs. And again, that's just from a moderate uh, rain event with a moderate severity fire. These sort of events uh, would potentially have uh, effects on dam operations, of course, water quality, like we saw uh, over in Las Vegas and Guyenas, and extreme scenarios could fill both reservoirs with sediment. One thing to note, uh, again, those uh, reduce reduction of fire severity from treatments, they also play out in uh, reduction of debris from, from post-fire debris flows. And uh, the, the blue arrows are pointing to basins that were treated, uh, and you see that, that uh, lighter color, and they're adjacent to basins uh, to the right that were untreated. And so again, we have reason to believe, and there's uh, experiential evidence that uh, these treatments, basically reduction of all that fuel that's accumulated over the last century, will would reduce fire severity and then ultimately reduce debris volume. And with that, I will turn it over to Tom. Okay. Hello, everybody. Um, I'm Tom Swetnam, and uh, this is a, a very much um, boring introduction compared to Alice's wonderful slides of his family in the in the watershed and elsewhere in New Mexico. I just want to introduce myself a little bit and tell you a little bit about my background. I'm not going to go into any of the details on this, but just wanted to mention that I am a native New Mexican. I grew up in New Mexico, um, went to grade school in Penasco and high school in Hema Springs. And my wife and I retired here to Hema Springs back home about eight years ago after living in Tucson for 35 years where I was a professor and a director of the tree ring laboratory. And before that, I was a wildland firefighter for three seasons in uh, the Gila wilderness in New Mexico. And that was a really formative experience for me to see fire on the landscape, um, low intensity fire burning naturally in the wilderness. Um, and I had experience of high severity fires and uh, as a hotshot in, in Idaho. So it really affected my understanding of fire and fuels and especially the importance of driving fire regimes. Um, over the last 40 years or so, I've been fortunate to work with people like Ellis Margolis uh, as a graduate student and now a leading scientist and, and others um, and studying forest and fire regimes across Arizona and New Mexico. And uh, we've basically done fire and forest histories now over almost all major mountain ranges in, in northern New Mexico. Um, and we I also had experience working on mixed and high severity fire regimes in northern Rockies and Siberia, Russia. I, I tell you all this just to, to point out that I understand and we, we've had a, a, a broad perspective of fire regimes across elevational gradients and across different regions. And we understand what high severity fire regimes look like in the paleo record. And we understand what they look like today and our interpretations of high severity fire and low severity fire in the context of fuels is based on really broad experience. Um, the other stuff are just some accolades that um, I won't go into, but uh, it took 
learned, if you want to learn a, a little bit more about me and where I'm at and where I'm coming from a personal perspective is I, this is a picture of where I live. Actually, this is the Hamas Valley, Hamas Canyon, Hamas Springs down Canyon there. And uh, there's a video interview uh, of me by Laura Pascas, ex excellent environmental reporter uh, a few years ago. And the, the title of it is Preparing Homes for Fire Season. So it's an online video. And there's about a 15 minute video there and you can see how we're trying to deal with this very dangerous situation that I live in, that I've chosen to live in. This is the Wui. This is a one-way road coming up to my house and my neighborhood, very steep landscape with lots of fuels. And I wouldn't have moved here if I didn't believe that we can mitigate fire, high severity fire risks by doing forest treatments and, and reducing the fuels. And it's not just about the wooey uh, and the risk to home. It's also about risk to water. This is the water supply that's about 400 yards from my house upslope. And this water supply is about about three, about two thirds of the water for Hamas Springs. And we could lose that in an afternoon with fire running up these slopes. And so we've been working to try to treat uh, around these water supplies um, and also with the Forest Service on adjacent, uh, adjacent properties. And really something must be done because if we don't, it's just a matter of time. Um, so here's the main points I wanna make over the next few minutes. Um, that is, We've learned a lot. This is about um, looking at the past and understanding the changes that have occurred in these landscapes. And Native Americans, Puebloan people, especially the Hamas people and the Tewa people of the um, upper Rio Grande uh, around Santa Fe and Spanish and American colonists greatly altered these woodlands and forests in many ways, especially around Santa Fe with its long history. Um, fuel wood gathering, timber harvesting, especially. And what we see with historical record with tree rings and photography and other sources that that removing the fuels reduce the extent and severity of fires in Ponderosa Pine. And we also learned that um, these land use practices actually buffered the, the climate fire response that we typically see over the Southwest. So I'm gonna touch on each of those major points here in the next few minutes. But um, first, this is the this is a kind of an image of the Hamas landscape with the very big villages that existed here on the mesa tops above Hamas Springs. Um, and this is the interesting situation where people in large numbers, thousands of people living in woodlands and forests for hundreds of years. How did they do that? How did they not burn up? Well, <laughs> long story short is people used fuels. They used the fuel woods to burn in their hearths. And so all around the villages, there were very few trees. I'm actually hesitant to show this picture on the right, this artist rendition, because it does show cleared around the, the village but in fact, up to a half a mile or a mile away from these villages, there were very, very few trees growing. And we know that from the extensive tree ring studies we've done uh, around many of these big village sites in the Hamas in the last 10 years. And there's a, a lot to this, and I'll, I'll, I'll give you a link to some, uh, some of the papers in a, in a minute. But uh, some of the basic take homes that we've learned is that, you know, the, the, the fuels have built up because of the lack of fires, the lack of spreading fires, and the lack of people removing small diameter trees for fuel and for vigas for their houses. This is a ruin. This is one of the ancient ruins up above Hamas Springs, a photograph in 1900. The trees have already started to grow in up next to the village. And by 2015, that's actually me standing in the same place that this guy is standing, the same ruin. Trees have grown onto and around the, the village and a consequence of that is that wildfires burning in the Hamas now are burning over these old villages that we have no evidence of high severity fires ever burning over these, these villages in the past. There's no archeological evidence. There's no ethnological uh, verbal uh, stories or legends of, of towns being burned over. But now these sites are burning with high severity and actually damaging the, the archeology, span uh, ruining some of the pottery and the the, the, the lithics and even the room building blocks are spalling from the heat. Um, again, there's a multiple papers we published in the last 10 years on this topic and um, including proceedings of the National Academy of Science in 2016 and 2021. And just a few weeks ago, this paper at the bottom, we uh, published looking at the influence of, of intensive land use by people, Native American people, Puebloan people, on mitigating and buffering the effect of climate variability on fires and, and actually have a mitigating effect. 
Uh, so I'll talk about that in a minute. Here's a, another paper um, that talks about fire and climate in the Hamas and people. If you'd like to receive any of these papers, send me an email. There's my email address, treering1748 at gmail.com. And um, you can also visit that website there and see a lot more information about, about this, uh, this, these studies of people and fire and climate and how, how people interacted with fire and lived with, with fire for, for centuries, literally centuries. The, the study just published a couple of weeks ago, looking at climate and fire linkages in the Southwest is drawing on a very large network of sites, more than 180 sites across Arizona, New Mexico. And what we did was we looked at how the fire, the big fire events were related to drought and what we find typically over the whole region is that fire years occur during drought years, the dry years shown here on the lag year is zero. And typically one to two or three years of wet conditions occur before the fire year. So in, in New Mexico, it's like El Nino years produce wet conditions and reduce the fire activity. And then you hit a La Nina condition like we have the last three years, that's when things burn. So this wet dry switching has been operating for centuries in New Mexico. But interestingly, when we zoomed in to particular landscapes where there are lots of people during certain time periods in the high intensive use periods, that linkage fell apart. There was much weaker connection between the wet dry switching. So in other words, people buffered the extreme variations of climate. It's telling us that, you know, if you if you use fuels and you burn it, you burn it with surface fires or you use it in your hearths, you're going to reduce the extent and, and severity of fires over the landscape. The last little part of this talk is about um, changes around Santa Fe, especially with the photographic record. Um, you know, it's this is Santa Fe of all many many of the villages and towns in northern New Mexico is one most heavily inhabited for hundreds of years, at least 400 years um, and longer if you consider the Tewa people living here with their pueblos nearby. But one of the impacts of people living on a landscape for 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 hundreds of years with now you know, electric uh, heating or gas heating is that you have to use fuel wood. And so you just do the numbers of cords, the amount of cordwood that had to come out of the forest uh, up to 10, 20 miles, 30 miles away from Santa Fe. It's huge. Uh, one of the common photographs you'll see in the photographic archives of the Palace of the Governors are dozens of photos of, of burrows uh, carrying fuel wood into Santa Fe and also Latias and Vigas. So on the right here, you see these Vigas on the ground. I've been doing tree ring dating work in uh, Santa Fe and elsewhere around northern New Mexico of old haciendas and churches recently with my colleague Tom Wines with the Park Service. And we look at the dates of the timbers, we, we, we determine when these timbers were put in the roofs. And it turns out many of the old haciendas and churches, they've had the roofs replaced many times because these old adobe houses, the roofs rot out and they have to be replaced. The, the bottom line story is there is that many trees were cut for fuel wood and vigas and timbers for 400 plus years in Santa Fe. And as a consequence, the landscape looks really different now uh, than it used to for hundreds and hundreds of years. Here's an 1866 photograph. And you can see there's the St. Francis Cathedral and the foothills in the background there. There's virtually no pinons in the lower foothills where now you have dozens or hundreds of homes, very valuable homes, I might say, in the foothills of Santa Fe there and big open patches on the forest above. And you a view a little bit further to the west in the 1880s. And here's a bird's eye view map of Santa Fe from 1882. Again, look at, look at the foothills looks like in this bird's eye view, which reflects what's shown in the photos. Here's the Santa Fe River coming down out of the watershed. The bottom line is that we've got huge changes and people, this is what we call the shifting baseline syndrome, I think, there's a lack of perspective that that closed canopy pinon juniper woodlands. I actually like them too. I like to have a very robust pinon juniper woodland around my house too. But there's consequences for having continuous fuels over these landscapes. And what you have today is not the way that it's always been. I'm not saying that we need to go back to this kind of an overused, over harvested landscape, not by any means, but uh, lower density forests and woodlands would be a very wise uh, a thing to do in the context of climate change and the fires we're having. So just a few more slides of um, the watershed. This is the McClure Reservoir. And you can see this 1926 photo, you can actually see some snow on the ground, the open stand conditions compared to the more closed stand conditions today. 
Um, and here's a, another one from 1916, again, overgrazing and overcutting in the early period resulting in erosion. And you know the proposed thinning for the watershed and surrounding areas is nothing like that. It's more like, do we open up stands like to look more like that rather than this kind of closed stand condition, much more sustainable from a long-term perspective with fire regimes. This last, uh, this is a, one of the great uh, aerial photography comparisons in one of Ellis's papers that shows the watershed on the left in 1935. There's an, air, an airplane flying over the watershed and you, you can see a lot of ground there. There's a lot of you know, grassland and inner spaces between the trees compared to 2005. The bottom line is that we've greatly increased the connectivity of the fuels in the last 100 to 150 years. In fact, these changes are nothing. Um, I and mean, what we've got now is the most continuous canopy coverage of woodlands and forests in at least 400 years. And summarizing, you know, prior to European colonization, the fieldwood gathering and small tree harvesting and setting small fires served to reduce wildfire extent and severity. We published on this repeatedly, it, it, and this is what we find. When people use fire in the landscape, small fires, you know, we don't get the high severity uh, fires. And then, um, you know, again, overgrazed and over harvested forests are not what we're trying to, to aim for, on the contrary, but reducing uh, current forest density and fuels is, is going to reduce the likelihood of wildfire extent severity and mitigate the effects of extreme climate variability. Finally, fuels, fuels do matter. As an ex-wildland firefighter, it, it kind of makes my head spin a little bit when people say that it's just all about climate change and you know, the warming temperatures is driving all of it. No, fuels and climate are important. In fact, fuels are maybe more important when climate warms up. So um, dealing with the fuels is a reasonable approach in my view. I'll leave it there. Thank you, Tom. And now we have Craig Allen. Um, yeah, well, thank you. I'm gonna close the presentation part and um, I'm not going to really discuss this slide, just there's some background information here, but uh, the main point to know really is it's been my pleasure, really, to have had the opportunity to spend my adult life here in New Mexico. I grew up in Wisconsin, but I've spent my whole adult life out here living and working primarily actually in the Hamas Mountains inside of things. This will be the 43rd year in a row I'm doing field work here, coming up in 23, um, based out of the Hamas side. Um, let's see, what do I need to do here to make these move? Oh, there we go. Um, but, you know, I grew up, I grew up part of a big family in Northeast Wisconsin. Um, when I was a kid, grandpa bought a little swampy 40 acre woodlot less about a mile from the farm, the ancestral farm he grew up on. And that's, um, dad taught high school biology and I didn't even know it, but that's what I was doing, learning um, without training. It was sort of how to read the landscape, understand the history of a landscape that had been really worked hard by people for a long time. Um, and it turns out I've spent my whole adult life in this landscape. Since 1981, I did both my master's and PhD in this landscape, studying landscape change. Forest change is part of that. Fire is part of it. I started working with Tom for sure as early as 84. I don't remember, but because uh, fire was such, an ex such a clear driver of all sorts of patterns on the landscape, uh, certainly including vegetation. Um, I did that work and I've been based continuously since the 80s out of uh, an office in Bandelier. I retired as a research ecologist with USGS uh, almost two years ago. Um, but I started with the Park Service till they moved the researchers out in 1993, at which point I started a field station, the Hamas Mountains <laughs> Field Station. A uh, we're, we're a field station of the Fort Collins Science Center of USGS. Ellis runs that field station now. Um, but prior to that, through 83, from when I finished dissertation, from 89 through 93, I was working directly for the Park Service for Bandelier as an ecologist, and job one was setting up monitoring 
and baseline studies of this little park unit, Bandelier, that had had all this archaeological work done, but not very much ecological stuff done. So we have put together an amazing uh, amount of work. It's kind of like a little mini long-term ecological research site. Um, Kay Bealey there in the hat, we've been working together more than 30 years. I actually volunteer for Kay now. We've got loose ends, so many data sets. But we've looked at the web of life, everything you can imagine. We've done something on from inventories of, well, you name it. Um, and as we, starting in 2000, Kay and I helped, Tom was on the board of trustees for the Vice Caldera when it was acquired in 2000. And for two years, we helped um, set up, basically we helped set, we set up the, the initial baseline and inventory monitoring and science programs for the Caldera as well that Bob Parmenter has <laughs> taken and run with. So we have from the Rio Grande to Redondo Peak, the big peak in the middle of the Caldera, this uh, elevational gradient of countless kinds of studies on you know, everything from soils and hydrology and herbaceous plants and woody plants. Most, almost everything you're seeing here are various kinds of veg plots. Um, tree growth, insects, avifauna, mammals, big and small, lots of things. The thing, when these studies were set up, the ones in Bandelier in particular, I arrived in the 80s from 78 to 95 was a relatively wet period. And it was a great place to be a tree forests, uh, the snowpacks were abundant, trees grew well. That changed in the late 90s. And this is a footprint of fires on top of this. And so part of the power of this network, we are continuing to learn from all these, all these long-term studies, these baselines out there. So we got it when the good times were rolling in uh, through the 80s and early 90s, when it was cooler and wetter. And now we're seeing the difference now that we're in this mega drought. And so much of the last 20 years of my career has been looking at these kinds of tipping point changes first here in Northern New Mexico. And then as time went on, we were kind of an early harbinger because it hit New Mexico, Northern New Mexico, the Hamas hard in the early 2000s. And scaling up to Western North America through research networks and then eventually even globally. So I'm gonna give you sort of just looking across the valley, straight across here at the Hamas, here's some of the things we've learned. Um, and uh, things that are applicable, we believe, to similar porous types here in, in, on the Sangre side, on the west flank here. Temperature, there's a uh, guy, was, Park Williams was postdocing at Los Alamos, uh, found a temperature signal in the regional tree ring record that um, it turns out that there's a, that warmer temperatures really have a strong effect, a negative effect on tree growth in this region, on conifers, uh, trees, and increased tree mortality processes. All of these are temperature related forest disturbances. And we sort of knew that, but the signal of it was stronger than people um, knew um, prior to some of the work in the last 20 years. And so this has been sort of a big point of research is all of these things, including fire, but not just fire, particularly the physiological drought stress and die off, it amplifies insect outbreaks, not just because the trees are stressed, but also directly affects the life cycles. Um, they can get more generations in, in a year. And what we've been seeing is that the warming has driven increased tree mortality from 2002 to 2004, all across the four corners. Millions of acres of multiple trees died all up and down the elevational gradient. These were pinyons, pretty much the Bandelier Los Alamos area, mature pinyons. 90 to 95% went down in 0203. Um, but all the way up to gradient, up to tree line here in the Pecos. Uh, these are recent photos. Drought trust trees uh, in this mega drought, which now appears to be the uh, base again on the tree records. Park Williams, who did that early work, has published um, in the last two years that it's now the most severe drought in at least the 1,200 years that we have a long enough tree ring record to assess it in terms of stress in the system. And 30% of that is due to the warming. So yes, of course, it's a, there's a precipitation deficit, but the warming is amplifying, it's aridifying the whole system. Ecosystems up and down from the deserts to the subalpine to the alpine. 
this tree mortality, and it was affecting grasses and shrubs. We've documented it. You know, it, it killed in 2002. It killed two thirds of the grass cover in the pinyon juniper woodlands in Bandelier on our long term transects there. It's killing trees in the by the first decade of the 2000s all across Western North America. Similar things were emerging, and it turns out. Um, Scaling up, I working with literally in the end hundreds of colleagues the last 15 years, this stuff is going on globally. And it turns out, for instance, the modelers, we know how to grow trees reasonably well in models, but we can't kill them realistically yet. Barely even single species. But working with many colleagues, we've pulled together the, the patterns at a global scale and have been working on trying to understand the processes underlie it and how vulnerable are the world's forests. Um, anyway, this has been a big point of work, but it was based and grounded in the work starting here in northern New Mexico. One of the things, unfortunately, sadly, for those of us who care about these incredible charismatic megaflora of big old trees, ancient iconic trees on the planet, is that they are disproportionately vulnerable to hotter drought stress, both in terms of its impacts on their growth and into their vulnerability to mortality from various processes. Um, and that's true. Warming is bad news for big trees on planet Earth, including here in northern New Mexico. Same things are going on here. Big old trees matter. One could talk a long time about this. It's something I've been working on a lot about these kind of ancient iconic trees in recent years. There's many, many values from very specific biodiversity values associated with it. Many other ecosystem services, the scientific values you've seen demonstrated today, the global carbon balance. The, <laughs> the largest 1% of trees in old growth forests globally, the largest 1% by diameter in all forest types averaged around the world, millions of trees in that data set, the largest 1% by diameter sequester half the above ground carbon. Big old trees are so important to the global carbon balance. And of course we care about them for many reasons. Um, and, and even their intrinsic value, they, these magnificent <laughs> beings deserve to exist um, and not be killed by our actions. Anyway, fire size and severity are clearly, I'm going to shift off of the die off stuff now to fire size and severity increasing. Craig, in the, real quick, yep. just, we have about two minute, two minute, two more minutes left for your All presentation. All right, let me roll then. We'll I'll go through the Hamas quick to get to the sun grace. In the Hamas, we've compiled the, the maps. For the first 70 years of the fire record, this is, there's the caldera, and boom, these are by decade. That's the last conscious and Thompson Ridge fire. The fires are getting bigger. It isn't the size of the fire, though, that we care as much about as the severity. The whole east flank of the Hamas has pretty much been converted and lost um, at this point. Um, from a conifer tree standpoint, there are things growing in there. Ellis talked about it, but shrubs and herbaceous plants at lower elevations, things, certainly things like aspen at higher elevations. Down in the woodlands, we're not even sure what's uh, gonna come back. This is so out of the, out of the box down there without precedent. Um, and then the watershed stuff, I won't address that any further, Edelis did it, but I will just say things like the Las Conchas fire triggered from Santa Clara, every canyon on the east flank, from Santa Clara wrapping all the way down to Cochiti. Every one of those canyons had after Las Conchas had high severity floods and debris flows. And we've been studying this recently in, in the streams of Bandelier in these canyons, which were linear oases, and they were basically sterilized. The aquatic invertebrates were wiped out. We've lost, we think, at least one tree species, maybe two from the whole park, uh, Arizona alder, beautiful tree, one of my favorite trees. Um, anyway. Huge impacts in the ecosystems from the riparian zone to the uplands. Um, lots of things could be said about that. What does it look like on the Sangre side to close this out? Similar, if you look at the record of historic fires, it's ramping up here too. So this is through 1999, the historic fires in the Southern Sangres. There's adding the decade of the 2000s and you can see the footprints getting larger. Here's the 2010s. Here's the first few years of the 2020s. And of course, now the Sangres have had their mega fire uh, in Hermit's Peak, Calf Canyon, um, which is having similar kinds of impacts to a 
to private and public infrastructure that we don't need to talk about, but the, the impacts of these things, we're talking billions and billions of dollars. Um, that same vulnerability, I would just note, exists here, that little dashed area is the fire shed. And you'll note there's almost no fire activity in there, yet all of those fires here in the middle, those are actually the prescribed burns in the municipal watershed. But much of that is just waiting for an ignition on the wrong day. Um, so in closing, I would just say that, that there's just an abundance of robust, diverse, this is just the, the, the tip of the iceberg of there's literally hundreds, if not thousands of different kinds of ecosystem studies done here in Northern New Mexico um, in the last 40 years. And there's a lot of vulnerability. We see those patterns, but we aren't, do know there's some things we can do. These simple proven management treatments of thinning the small trees from below and then reducing the fuels with managed fire, which obviously has to be done skillfully. Um, but we can improve the resilience of our forests and our big old trees. If we care about the big old trees, no action is a death sentence to them. And I would just say that there is hope. These, these are worrisome times. Um, these systems have been in the process. This is what we've been documenting. They're, they're of necessity are resetting themselves. They're restructuring, reorganizing under the face of these climate stresses and the stresses from these land use density woodification processes. But there are hope, but we do need to act with some urgency. You can see, we all can see how rapidly things are changing. We need to work together collaboratively. We're gonna to need to continue to learn because there are many surprises. We could have given a lot of interesting talks about what has surprised us moving along. Um, and so we need to continue to learn. And with that, we'll get to questions. So thank you. Thank you very much, Greg. Appreciate that. I'd invite Greg, uh, Tom and, and Ellis to go ahead and show their video and I'll go ahead and just hand out uh, questions and we'll see where, where we end up going with them. Uh, I'd say feel free to kind of let me know who wants to take them or just go ahead. Uh, the first one that we got were, we are still experiencing some very, very windy days and big gusts of wind at times. This must be taken into account before any control burns are done. How can we be assured that the Forest Service makes this a high priority in decision making? And I want to say none of us here are work for the Forest Service, but how can we perhaps you know guide them in in creating priorities in in their decision making regarding um, you know how these control burns are done? I'll, I'll uh, chime in a little bit. At first, uh, as, as Porfirio said, we're, none of us here are Forest Service. None of us here uh, currently um, work in fire. And so, um, again, I don't think we have, we have a, a, a say in, in that question particularly, but I will say that understanding the processes of the Forest Service they have uh, rules, regulations. Those are now increasingly scrutinized. There will be a follow-up talk um, by the fire manager from the Santa Fe, is my understanding. And so I think that those sort of questions, Porfirio and uh, to whoever asked that, will be addressed by Santa Fe Fire Management. And um, again, it's my understanding if people haven't read, there are now seven additional rules uh, that need to be boxes that need to be checked um, from, came down from the chief of the forest service for prescribed fire. So there is clearly increased scrutiny um, on prescribed fire, again, given, given uh, some of the recent events. But I, I don't think any of us are, uh, have, the, have the knowledge to address that question, but, but please chime in. I'm excited to actually to hear um, what the Forest Service has to say about new rules on prescribed fire. Um, and that, I think that that webinar should be coming up in, in January uh, from the fire shed. Yeah, thanks, Elsie. Yeah, my understanding is, you know, the, the chief of the Forest Service did a review on the prescribed burn program across the country, created those seven kind of um, recommendations, sent those to all the forests. The forests need to address those. And my understanding, the Santa Fe National Forest uh, has reviewed those and addressed them and sent their uh, implementation plan or, or whatever it's supposed to be called. I don't know what their process is exactly, but has sent that to the regional office for their review and approval. And then I believe that goes to the the Washington office to the chief to review and approve. 
before uh, that comes out. So I, I agree, I think in, in January or whenever they're ready to prepare what they've decided that's been approved that they can uh, go forward with their burn program is, is gonna be presented in a, in a similar format here, uh, maybe even perhaps in person. Uh, the next question I have is, if, if grazing and logging were allowed, would it limit some of the fire damage uh, if we had more grazing and more, uh, uh, more logging? I guess, and there was a similar comment towards that as far as, um, and I'll read that as well, uh, it related to this where there used to be a number of sawmills in Southern New Mexico that kept a lot of the mountains there cleaner. There were also a number of permits that were uh, pulled that grew a tremendous about, that grew a tremendous amount of fuel because no grazing or, or logging were happening on those areas. Uh, the fuel was a driver in the black fire. Looks like grazing would have taken care of part of that problem. I see the Forest Service pulling all these permits all the time for no more logging, and it's all done in the guise of saving something or other, and it doesn't seem to have worked very good. So it's all along with that grazing and logging kind of thought. Would that help? Well, I'll just chime in. I, you know, um, in my perspective, it, the problem is not the lack of logging. I mean, the problem is that. Um, we, we have too many small diameter trees. And, you know, it, it, it's the problem of dealing with small diameter trees. And, and um, you know, they don't, they don't fit, they're not the saw logs, they can't produce boards. I mean, you can get products out of them, but it, they're more expensive. In the end, um, what I see is we did an investment in our forests. We spent, you know, the last 100 years plus pulling big trees out of many of these landscapes. and. Uh, now is the time to, to reinvest in these landscapes and remove small diameter trees. Sure, you make some products out of them where you can, but in the end, it's going to cost to do a lot of this thinning work and prescribed burning, but it'll save money in the long term. It's much less expensive to, to do the thinning work and prescribe fires, reintroducing fire, than it is to put these fires out, which and the damages that they cause are in the hundreds of millions to billions of dollars. If we had spent that amount of money on on actually investing in the forests, um, we we would have prevented these high severity fires in in the first place, and um, you know so so again it's like I I don't I don't see that increasing uh, large diameter tree cutting is not not the solution at all. We need to deal with small diameter trees, right? Grazing, uh, yeah, livestock grazing can reduce the spread of fire, but it has to be pretty intensive to do that. So I don't know how many places we can actually graze to that intensity and there's consequences of, of over intensive grazing as well. So yeah, I mean, there's a, there's a role for multiple use of our landscapes, but in the end right now, I think we need, we need a big investment in our forests to prevent them from burning catastrophic, catastrophically and converting to shrublands and grasslands. I would just say one more thing about the grazing, which is that <clears throat> the forests, the sort of overdense dog hair thicket kind of forest, there's nothing to graze for the cattle underneath. The herbaceous part of the system has been squeezed out by this woodification over the last century plus. So the livestock grazing did actually, our best <laughs> understanding the tree ring record, it's pretty clear it actually, the surface fires stopped in the late 1800s before active fire suppression was, was even an institutionalized policy or there were hardly any resources, but it's because it was open with grassy understories. And so the livestock grazing, it's effective in those kinds of systems, but in the stuff like in the fire shed here, these, these, the systems, these dry conifer forests that are overgrown at grazing wouldn't, wouldn't have any effect and the cows wouldn't stay there. <laughs> they, they, would, they would move because they would starve, so. Thank you, Craig and Tom. Let's see, I'll keep moving down the hill. There's, there's a question for Alice uh, about William Baker's study in 2017, analyzed the map you presented of composite fire intervals in the municipal watershed and found them to be inaccurate. Um, um, I don't know if you have a response to this or if, or if it's best to, or maybe there's a, I don't know if there's a short answer. Ellis? 
Uh, yeah, the, the short answer is that um, I actually did not show Santa Fe watershed data. Um, the little bit longer answer is that there are multiple studies that show that tree rings can very well replicate known fires and that these records are not biased. And that if you hold a piece of wood in your hand from the Santa Fe fire shed and it says it, it has 10 fire scars on it, then um, you know, no sort of uh, reanalysis of the data is even needed. Uh, it, it's clear there was historical fire, they were low severity, and uh, yeah, I'll, I'll end with that. Thank you, Ellis. Um, let's see, I, I want to go through these. I'm trying to get to all of them. I don't know if I will get to all of them, but is the Santa Fe ski area in danger from fire? Why? The Santa Fe water supply, is that in danger? Is the Santa Fe econ economy in danger? And, and, any, uh, and why? I think that's you, Ellis. Sure, I'll, uh, I'll share screen um, here a little bit again, uh, touching on the question about the Santa Fe ski area. And um, again, we have uh, some information here. Let's see, let me get that in full. People seeing that? Uh, so this is a photo of the Santa Fe ski area uh, in the early 1900s. And um, so, the tree ring records I talked about and the fire regimes I talked about are from that middle elevation zone uh, of dry conifer forest. And once you get up to the spruce fir and up into the, the aspen, there's a different type of fire regime. And it's basically crown fire, meaning that it burns to the ground, the aspen re-sprout, and then there's a successional cycle where the spruce and fir come in. And so uh, that's what historically happened in the upper elevations. Uh, here is uh, the the retake of the ghost Santa Fe ski runs, which many people uh, on the call probably know, but that's an old crown fire patch. And uh, so the data do not suggest that uh, it's at all the same story I talked about with the tree ring fire scars. This is a different fire regime. We've got data, we've got papers on this. I'm happy to share that. And uh, so any sort of management prescribed fire is not, uh, <laughs> would not be uh, informed you know, recommended by the data in this type of uh, fire regime. These burn to the ground and you just need to be prepared for when they burn, you get out of the way because they're uh, large, severe fires and there's not much to do about them. And so a very different fire regime. And yes, the ski area is potentially at risk. Uh, and then uh, the upper watershed of the, of the upper portion of the Santa Fe municipal watershed is spruce fir. And we know that that last burned uh, in the year 1685, and it burned in a high severity fire that burned uh, most of the forest down. There are no fire scars. Uh, when we were walking around in that forest, we found, uh, we found no fire scars in the spruce fir zone. It's a similar forest type as this one you're looking at here, those highest elevations. Um, and there are, my understanding and my recommendation based on the data, there are no treatments proposed in those upper elevation systems. Uh, they're a different type. And so again, our understanding of the fire ecology of the system um, is, is useful in thinking about uh, whether there have been changes that are outside the historical norm in those upper elevations. It's very likely that those are more similar um, and will burn similarly to the way they used to be. And there's not too much you can do about it. Whereas if you move down into that middle zone that we talked about, those, that's kind of the sweet spot where the ecology of the system and the changes are something um, that people can potentially, uh, you know, alter the fire regimes and, and the evidence that Thomas showed. That's where people were living. The Jemez were living at, you know, seven, 7,500 feet in those pine zones. They weren't living up in a spruce fir forest, uh, probably because they knew better <laughs> that they, they'd get roasted, right? And so, um, so again, I think that that's where understanding the, the fire ecology is important to think about potential management. Thank you, Ellis. Um, and this is probably one for you as well, possibly. Um, I think you talked about this, but could you reiterate, how do we know historic fires didn't burn at, at high severity? Yeah, that's a, a good question. Uh, 
And so uh, like the photos I just showed, when you have high severity, you, you kill the forest, right? By definition, you kill large patches of trees. And so when you go in and look at the ages of the trees, uh, like we've done up in the ski area, you see a very even age forest where there's a cutoff, no trees have survived, and then the aspen especially re-sprout. And so we have data and we know what uh, tree ring data and forests look like in those high severity systems where you have uh, often younger stands and then there's a, a threshold and there are no fire scars. And so again, we spent weeks <laughs> walking through many of those systems looking for fire scars and, and, and they don't exist because in those upper, in those upper forests. Um, whereas if you get down into that, that middle band, uh, the ponderosa pine and the mixed conifer, you find fire scars everywhere. You can't walk around without finding. And again, a fire scar by definition is unequivocal evidence of low severity fire at that point. That tree survived the fire to record a fire scar. And so, um, and then we have networks. We have large networks uh, to, to understand what happens in between. And so um, the, the best evidence we have is that especially in the Ponderosa Pine Zone, you don't find large patches of young trees. You find fire scars everywhere. As you move up the elevation gradient into the mixed conifer, again, uh, we have a paper that goes from the Ponderosa all the way to the top from low severity fire regime to high severity fire regime. And in that middle, you have, uh, a, in the mixed conifer zone, you have a, maybe a mix of low severity and high severity. And in the Santa Fe watershed, in that mixed conifer zone, in the bottom part of the wilderness, we found little patches uh, of, of high severity where, uh, you know, a fire in 1842, it killed that little stand on the north slope. Uh, and, and then uh, we would date, it dated all the trees and they all dated to after that. And so there are, there are ways, and we have, again, we have data to show where we think there was historical high severity fire. And that's in those more productive systems, the higher wetter as you move up the mountain and those lower systems, uh, we just find no evidence of it. And again, we've been wandering around in these places for 20, uh, in Tom and Craig's cases, 30, 40 years. And, and the proponents of the data shows that, that there's fire scars everywhere and, uh, and there's no evidence for those large high severity patches like we do see, we do see ha and have evidence at the higher elevations. And, and one more question towards that high elevation is, do you think that higher elevation stand replacing fires are larger in scale and less patchy now than say 300 plus years ago? That's a great question. Um, this is, uh, and, and so when I suggest that those systems and the higher elevation systems are behaving more like we think they did historically, this is actually the one place um, in terms of patch size how big were the patches of those high severity uh, fires? And, and that's the one place where there is a little bit of data suggesting that maybe now the patches are larger because there are huge carpets of forest um, that, that can burn all at once. And that historically, there may have been more of those patches uh, to break up the, the kind of the carpet of fuels. And so, but those data are, are hard to get at um, because what happens up in upper elevations is you have a patch of forest that gets killed and then another patch burns over it, and all of a sudden that record starts to go away. And, and we did our best to try and understand the size of those high severity patches, but it's, it's a really a, a challenge. And so, but I think there is some evidence to suggest that the higher elevations, that those patches may be getting larger because it's, it's, it's more homogenous. There aren't different stand ages. And then clearly now the fires can run in a crown fire from the PJ all the way up to the top, right? The bottom of the forest, all the way to the top because there's a carpet of fuel, like Tom's repeat photo showed, that there's no discontinuity in the fuels, that there's just a carpet. And so you can have crown fire across the whole system. And again, when you combine those different forest types, those patches are clearly larger in the lower end. And then when you combine them with the upper end, those patches uh, are, are clearly much larger uh, across the gradient than, than any we have records for. All right, so one more. Uh, so since climate is changing, why should we be focused on these historic densities and historic fire regimes since we're, you know, are those, is that still applicable to try and move towards that? Sure, I'll, I'll take that. So, um, you know, we, we, use, we use history data just to understand how we got to the <clears> present <throat> and as a guide in some way to how we might operate in the future. And you know, fire history has shown us that there's been wide variations in forest densities and fire regimes over time, but overall, um, climate and fire are very closely coupled, 
And just a, a, an example I would give of where the past is still useful for understanding the present and maybe aiming toward the future, are the giant sequoia groves. We had 3,000 years of fire history from fire scars there. And over that 3,000 years, there's a period known as the medieval warm period or the medieval drought period. This is probably the warmest period in the last 3,000 years, excepting for the present, the last few decades with, with greenhouse induced warming. And during that time period, giant sequoias burned the most frequently and they survived because they were low severity fires. So basically the, the fire regime responded by having a lot more fires, but they tended to be low severity and really low extent. So the more frequent the fires occurred, the lower severity, low intensity, low flame lengths burning through the understory. So what the lesson there is, is that as the temperatures warm up, actually it's more important that we reintroduce more fire into these forests of the right kind. And these pine forests and pine dominated mixed conifer forests, low severity fires can impart a resilience to those forests because it reduces the fuels and allows those big old trees to survive the fires that come through. And here's the problem in the sequoia groves where we've lost maybe you know, up to 20% of the biggest trees have been killed in five years, a stunning figure. Well, the main reason for that is that those forests have grown up with understory canopies of, of shade tolerant trees. And where the sequoias have survived the best in the groves in the last five years is where there's been thinning and reintroduced fire. The groves that have been treated have survived. The groves, the back country that haven't been treated, that's where the greatest mortality has occurred. And uh, well, we have one more one, one on the same issue with the uh, uh, values. Are we concerned with over desiccation with over thinning for establishment? Um, I think catch with the with the VPD values. Are we concerned with over desiccation with over thinning for reestablishment? That's a weird question. I can take a shot at that if, if, unless anybody else wants to. Um, so I, I think my understanding of the question is that uh, if you're if you're thinning the forests, then potentially you have more more sun hitting the ground, um, and and is is how how does that change right? How does that change the the environment? And and this is a it's an open question. It's an interesting and important question because again we're 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 taking forests that are in in this uh, unnatural state and 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 then in some cases pushing them back to uh, maybe a historical state and changing densities through fire and or thinning. And, and some of the studies that I've seen have shown that, uh, that you actually have more moisture and um, a higher resilience, if you will, to the drought stress, again, in that, in that mixed conifer zone, ponderosa pine zone, basically because there's more resources, there's more water to go around. And so if you, right, if you have a, a, a 10 times more trees than you did uh, you know, historically, um, then you're, you're sharing, you're, you're, you're spreading those resources that much thinner and, and including water, right? Craig's uh, presentation that shows that you're just having more aridity in the system as you crank up the temperature. And so there is indication that um, stands that are in, a, in, in more of an open state, um, that there's more resilience to these droughts and, and even to the, the bark beetles. Um, there's a, a really cool study that shows that uh, Trees that have experienced fire have resin ducts, more resin ducts than trees that, that haven't. And resin ducts are one of the primary ways that trees fight bark beetles. They, they pitch out the resin, right? And so uh, Sharon Hood is the study. It's one of the coolest ecology studies I've ever seen um, that shows that as trees are, are experienced fire again, you know, after not seeing fire for a century, that they have more resin ducts and potentially uh, could be more resistant. To, to some of the stressors related to VPD and other things that Craig outlined, but even just directly having more, you know, having more water and resources uh, in, these, in these increasingly uh, drier times is something that seems like it's an indication as these stands return to densities we think they were historically. I'll just say a little more about that. The, I mean, the, yeah, wasn't well, entirely clear of the of the the particulars of the question, but it is there are a lot of variables involved affecting the water balance on a site in these systems. 
Um, and people have been looking actually at this kind of thing in the mountains, Southern Rockies in the Southwest for decades. There, there used to be in the 60s and 70s, a lot of experimentation where there was actually trying to figure out how to increase water yield out of the mountains when forestry and timber activities were a bigger thing. And, and that was, they could do that. And more recently, the last couple of decades, it's been more about looking at um, the water balance on the site, although now still wondering how much of it is affecting as we're seeing the, the runoff, snowpack runoff relationships changing. But anyway, there's a sweet spot with density. If forests are wall-to-wall, -wall really dense canopies in this, in this uh, climate here, when it snows in the winter, a lot of the snow is captured on the on the canopy and it actually there's a the sublimation is where when after you know we get a storm and it clears out and the sun is shining right there at the at that surface of the canopy it's warm enough that it goes straight from snow to water vapor to the atmosphere and uh, similar things happen when you open the canopy if you open the canopy too much with how much snow is on the ground so there's these kind of 40 to 60%, 50%, you go under 30, then it's too open. You get more than 60, it's too dense. So there's a sweet spot in the middle, but it depends on a lot of other particulars. But, um, but in terms of just how much of the, the incident precip, particularly the snowpack actually is able to melt and be, become part of the soil recharge and plant available water on that site and the the water that actually can make it into streams is surface runoff as well. In, uh... But it's not an easy thing. I guess that's what I'm saying. It's not a clear cut thing. And, you know, it's like not thinning is good or bad or whatever. It's, it depends on, like so many things, depends on how it's done. So. Well, thank you, Craig. I really appreciate that. I really appreciate listening to all three of you talk tonight and, and kind of tell us about what fire ecology is. And I've definitely learned some things. Hopefully our audience has as well. And I think, you know, the fire shed is going to continue this conversation as we move forward into the new year. I wish everybody happy holidays. And as we move on, we'll, we'll be posting those things out. Um, stay tuned to the Santa Fe Fireshed.org website. Stay on the uh, Facebook page. And as we move forward, as the Forest Service makes plans, but as well as all the partners in the fire shed uh, have different plans and, and projects and things that they are going out on there. We'll have things to think about and talk about. And I'm sure you'll be hearing from us again. So I appreciate that. I appreciate everybody uh, joining us tonight. Thank you.